Welcome to Breaking News with Ben Hunt, Jack Forehand, and Matt Ziegler. Before we start, let me remind you what the show is not. Breaking News is not a show about fact-checking. Breaking News is not a show about saying whose bias is the one and only correct bias. And Breaking News is definitely not a show about calling out fake news. Breaking News is a show where we look at today's top stories and have a conversation around our favorite critical question, why am I reading this now? Drawing on the headlines we're tracking at fiatnews.com, join us as we talk about what's collectively making us tick with clear eyes, full hearts, and this obligatory disclaimer. Nothing in this podcast is advising you to buy or sell any security or to do anything with your money. Seriously, you should only act on investment advice from someone you know and someone who knows your unique situation. We are not that person. Welcome to Breaking News. I'm Matt Zegler, joined as always by Jack Forehand and Ben Hunt. Say hello, kids. Hello, Good kids. We've got a big show. We've got in the zeitgeist today, Tucker goes to Russia. Sounds like a children's story. Maybe it is. We've got a tweet of the week on Biden and this shrinkflation campaign. Jack, you've got a dumb question on the border crisis and making sense of it. And I've got a cultish corner on sixth grade traumas to send us all back to therapy over. We'll take us out with a summary after that. But first, we got a big story this week. Ben, we were talking about how there are at least 10 countries right now fighting an active war on multiple fronts in the Middle East. And no one thinks this is a big story. I don't want to say except us. There's plenty of people who yeah. think this is a big story with their feet on the ground. But start us here. I want to talk about what to think about this. But how do we think about the we don't need to talk about this reality of this conflict? Well, I, I tell you, Matt, I, I was so excited to have this as our big story that the war, the wars, plural, that are happening, it's not a big story. Right. So, and, and this is, you know, the more I live in narrative world, and I, and I feel like I've spent a professional career, 35 years immersed in narrative world, what I find is that as important as the narrative is, as important as the stories that we tell ourselves over and over again, what's certainly as fascinating to me are the stories we're not telling ourselves. What Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, the author famously called the dog that didn't bark. And I'm sure most of the listeners, viewers are familiar with the story, but for those who aren't, let me tell it anyway. So I, I forget which um, Sherlock Holmes story it is. Silver Blaze. That's it. That's it. So the, the Sherlock Holmes story, Silver Blaze. Holmes, of course, is announcing to Watson that he's figured out who the murderer was. And he's, you know, explaining it to, 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 to Watson. He said, well, you know, of course, the, the key to this mystery was, was the barking dog. And... Watson says, no, I'm a potent, you know, oh, there was no barking dog. And to which Holmes says, precisely, Watson, my good man, right? So the point being that Holmes figured out who the murderer was because the dog did not bark, meaning that the murderer was familiar to the dog. Right? And so that was the clue that, that, that Holmes needed to solve the mystery. Well, it's the same thing in narrative world. What is so fascinating to me are the dogs that are not barking. Because right now, I want to see if I can kind of list all the, the countries that are fighting an active, a hot war, people dying in the Middle East right now. So it's obviously Israel. Let's come back to see if we need to, to, I mean, Palestinians don't have their own state, but I'll, I'll put, I'll put Hamas in there also. Right. So the Gaza Strip and there's two, uh, Lebanon, right. We've got Hezbollah fighting an active war there. It's three Jordan. We've got three American soldiers who were killed there. Uh, we've got Syria five. Iraq, six, because, well, 
that's where the U.S. is bombing, and that's where the Iranian-supplied militias are coming from. So we've got to include Iran there, right? So we're up to seven. Uh, Pakistan, I'll go south in a second. But so, so we've got Pakistan is now bombing, uh, you know, Iranian-supported camps as well. Uh, so that's eight. We've got Yemen. That's going to be nine. We've got Saudi. I'll count Saudi. I mean, they're clearly fighting the, the Houthis also. So that's 10 right there. We've got the United States. That's 11. I'll leave out UK naval support or whatever they might be doing. I'll leave out the French. But we've got 11 countries, 10 in the Middle East, plus the United States, fighting a very active war, as in dropping bombs and soldiers and dying. I mean, hot war, hot war stuff. Guys, what? This, this, this is all over the Middle East. And, you know, it, it's nowhere. Right? You get the occasional story, oh, gosh, wouldn't it be awful if, you know, shipping stopped going through the Red Sea? Or, oh, you know, if there's an expansion, then what does this mean for the price of oil? And I'll tell you what it's meant for the price of oil and price of anything. It's, it's meant nothing. It's meant nothing. It's, had, it's, it's, a, it's a nothing burger in markets. And it's so oddly to me a nothing burger in American politics. It's a nothing burger in global media. Yes, that... you know, of, of course, the, the Israeli action in Gaza and let's leave them out. Let's leave them out as a combatant, even. Let's say that's just a, that's a, that's a so let's, let's leave them out. We've still got 10 nation states, because, you know, Gaza's not a nation state. We've still got 10 nations that are flying planes and dropping bombs and sending cruise missiles and the like. And it's not, it's not a story other than the, is it, the, other than the Israel and Palestinian story, the, the regional war, the regional war is not a story. And I get it's not a, a I was going to say it's not a, it's not like the Iran-Iraq war, right, where you've got hundreds of thousands of people dying in armies and tanks. But I, I, I mean, I mean, the, 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 the U S attacks were flying B one bombers over from the U S I mean, I mean, this isn't, this is not a walk in the park friends. Anyway, it's, it is amazing to me how little press and press attention this gets. Certainly relative to the border, the U.S. border, certainly relative to the other war that's, that's going on, Ukraine and Russia. Is this, is this just a function of until we see those effects here? Like you mentioned, oil prices are not up. I mean, the Suez Canal, it seems like a lot of the inflation from that is going to be a bigger issue for Europe than it's going to be for us. Um, you know, where the market is at all time highs. I mean, is it going to, is it really just a function of until we see those impacts, it's not going to be a story? You know, Jack, I thought that the three U.S. soldiers being killed and many others being, you know, badly wounded. I think we've had that. Maybe we had another one die. Anyway, I thought that would do the trick. I really did. I thought that would say, okay, you know. Shit's getting real. And it wasn't enough. I mean, that, that story had a half-life of, you know, 12 hours, and it quickly became a uh, photo op. And even kind of with these weird terms of art that the media, you know, that the White House put out there and the media took it, the, the dignified return, right? That's the, apparently a phrase of art for this stuff. And it just became a... 
a weird photo op thing as opposed to, oh yeah, three U.S. soldiers were killed in Jordan. And why do we have soldiers in Jordan? I mean, I, I, and, and look, I, I am, but I, I don't want to say, but, but I'm, I'm a legit expert in the Middle East and war there. I, I really am. I mean, I've spent years of my life studying this stuff, you know, the most mundane stuff, Russian or Soviet arms sales and, you know, warm water port facilities in the Middle East. I mean, I can still tell you about, you know, the port of Aden and the 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 arm sales that that the Soviet Union did. I'm sorry. Anyway, I've I've spent a lifetime or a big chunk of my life immersed in this stuff. And the fact that we've got whatever we've got a thousand, you know, U.S. servicemen uh, women in in Jordan is it's. Is kind of crazy to me. I don't know what makes it real, Jack. I mean, we've perfected the long distance art of warfare, of killing by drones. You know, that's that's how we've done it now for thirty years. I mean, we haven't had. I was trying to think when was the last time we had a a true kind of mass casualty event for U.S. soldiers. And I, I think it was uh, the uh, the Marines in Beirut, which was Reagan 82, 83. I think it was 1983. So it's it's been 40 years since we've had, I, I'm pretty sure that was the last big casualty event we had. And we, we got the hell out of Beirut after that, by the way. Um, I, so I, I, I know that the United States goes to great efforts not to have boots on the ground, even though we've got boots on the ground all over the place. I know that the U.S. makes a great effort to kill from a long distance Um with the precise aim of not having it become a big thing. But it's like the, it's like the, the frog in the pot of water that gets hotter and hotter. We've got a major war in the middle of Europe right now. And we've got 10 nations in the Middle East fighting a hot war right now. It just feels to me like we're the frog and the water's getting really hot and it's just completely off of everyone's radar screens. It does not exist in narrative world for any, for any real purposes. What are some of the, like for someone like me who doesn't understand this very well, like what are the, some of the risks that someone like you who, who does understand this very well, what, what are some of the risks I should understand about what's going on there? I mean, people talk about Iran getting involved. They talk about escalation. I mean, what are some of the major risks in terms of how this could go sideways that maybe someone like me might not see? Well, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what sideways means today, Jack. That, that's the question for, for me. It's because it's clearly it's not enough for a handful of American soldiers to be killed. That is, that's not enough to make it go sideways. Um, I forget exactly how many were killed in Beirut in 83. I think it was a little over 200. My best guess, you can, somebody can look it up, check, check me on that. But I think it was a little over 200 Marines. I don't know what makes it go sideways, to your point, Jack. And so we, we end up in these... For us, low level, but exceedingly expensive wars. I mean, that's, that's the trade off, right? It's incredibly expensive to fly a B 1 bomber over and to launch cruise missiles at the Houthi command and control installations. And I'm, and I'm not, 
I'm not an Uber dove. And I'm also, I, I, I recognize the, the world we're in and the bad people we're in. And I, and I very much believe in drawing lines and protecting shipping and all that stuff. I believe in all of that. The cost though we're paying is a, it is economic. I mean, it's, it's crazy expensive to do what we're doing. And B, there's a cost we're paying in our fabric. There's a cost we pay that we don't wrestle with these questions. I mean, we don't, we've made it impossible for it to go sideways to your point so that we, anyone cares. You know, there, there's some, we set up so many systems to prevent it from going sideways to, to a place that people care. So it's the, the Iron Dome, which, you know, we gave that technology to all the Gulf states and the Saudi also. I mean, the, the Houthis have been firing missiles at them too. It's something, I, I think that the technology here does prevent it from going sideways to a large extent. The, that, that Iron Dome technology, we don't talk about it very much, but that, to my mind, more than anything, has kept this, to your point, from escalating, from going sideways. Because, you know, thousands of missiles are being fired, whether it's in Israel, whether it's at Saudi, whether it's at Gulf states, thousands of them. And they're, the technology to knock them down is, is pretty crazy uh, effective. So we've spent a lot of money and we've developed this amazing technology to prevent it from going sideways, Jack. And so it's hard for me to see what makes it go sideways. And the cost of that is not just economic, but the cost of that is that it's invisible to us. Not invisible to the people there, for sure, but it's invisible to us here. And I, I can't say that that's good or bad. It just is, but it, it, there's something about that, that gnaws at me a great deal. Something about that, that gnaws at me a great deal. The, the war and conflict becomes truly entertainment. I, I mean, in a grisly sort of way, but it kind of is, it's, it's, it's not it's not experienced. I think the entire Afghanistan, you know, our longest war as Americans, our longest war is, uh, you know, a good example of that. That was so much out of sight and out of mind at just enormous economic. And I think, um, political cost or not political, cost, social cost. Is this part of the lesson from, I don't want to relate it to Vietnam or anything, but is this like the evolving narrative lesson of these types of conflicts? If you're not so clearly on the right side, then you just start to construct better and better ways to just stay as far away from it as possible. Somewhat. I, so the, I mean, the real, I think, lesson that came out of Vietnam was what used to be called the Powell Doctrine, uh, which was that. You have a, before you commit American military effort, there's a very clear and achievable end goal that you do, and then you are done that you declare that you, you, you say, okay, this is victory. You achieve victory and then you, uh, declare victory and you're out. And we, we so got away from that. I mean, I, I don't even know that the, it's not even really a thing anymore. And I think it's Afghanistan is what took us away from that, that we became in the, uh, the amorphous uh, role of nation building 
And look, I get it. I mean, there are no worse people in the world, not in the entire world, than the Taliban. I mean, they're, they're the worst. And so I get it from a, well, from all sorts of perspectives, I get it for why we would want to fight that war and build a modern as opposed to an, an, an anti-modern Afghanistan. I get, I get it, but, but, but we've, we, we got so away from the whole, uh, you know, doctrine of, of having, you know, clear goals, you win it, you declare it, and then you're out of it. And that it just doesn't exist anymore in, in our, in our military policy. Instead, we just, we've set it up so that it doesn't go sideways to use Jack's very good phrase. And it's out of sight and out of mind, except for as a mildly entertaining opportunity for photo shoots of patriotism and, you know, movies, you know, you know, Top Gun 2. I, I mean, seriously, it's just fodder for Hollywood now. From, from the U.S. perspective. From the U.S. perspective. I think that's perfect segue. Well, imperfect segue, perfectly mm. laid out. Let's go to the zeitgeist. We want to talk about Tucker goes to Russia. I want to start with this quote, though. This comes from Rusty Gwynn's piece, Useful Idiot, on Epsilon Theory. Because I think this is, I kept thinking of this as we're talking through mm -hmm. the way that the war is being depicted in the Middle East right now. And this, this quote from Rusty, he said, if there is one thing more dangerous to a functioning society than blithe acceptance of propaganda, it is the gullibility that it takes to believe that the propaganda you prefer is somehow different. That isn't really propaganda because it balances the scales or because it keeps them from controlling the narrative. Tell us a little bit, Ben, about Tucker Carlson's trip to Russia and what Rusty's talking about here. Yeah, so what Rusty is saying is that Tucker Carlson is to use the phrase that Lenin supposedly said. I don't think Lenin actually said it, but Lenin supposedly said that there were a lot of journalists in the West who were uh, useful idiots. That was, you know, the phrase that, that Lenin supposedly used, useful idiots. And Rusty's note, and boy, I agree with this, is that Tucker Carlson is a useful idiot for Vladimir Putin and, and Russia. Right. Is, is he a traitor? Oh, my God, no. I mean, come on. I mean, it's just such ridiculous stuff. He's just a useful idiot. He's a useful idiot. There's, there's not a single rationale for the Ukraine war uh, from Putin that is not passed through Tucker Carlson's lips. Not one. Not one. I, I mean, he's just, he is literally the ventriloquist dummy who just, is just, he just, he's a, he's a mouthpiece for whatever Putin wants to say. And that's, that's Tucker's shtick. I get it. I get the feeling he's very well compensated for it. And, you know, all good, man. All good. Is this yeah. just, is this the friendly dog thing to invoke Sherlock Holmes again? Like, is this just every mm. murderer needs a friendly dog or is it just? I, no, it's, 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 I think it's pretty different I, because the, the flip side of this is that when Tucker Carlson says that Western media is propagandists, Mm -hmm. Right. He's absolutely right. Yes, he is. Right. He's yes. absolutely right. 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 So, All the way around. <laughs> yeah. It, it's not that it's not that, oh, Tucker Carlson's a useful idiot, but, you know, Wolf Blitzer is not. I, I mean. Right. 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 Yeah. Are you sure. kidding me? I, yeah. I mean, I mean, of course, Wolf Blitzer is a useful idiot. 
the wolf of the Baskervilles coming up next. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> love, love it, love it, love it. it and so the, the, the quote you read, which is also just something I wish I'd written, which I wasn't thinking You about and me both. Is, but with what Rusty <laughs> writes, is that what turns us into useful idiots is when we say, oh, yeah, I, I, I know Tucker's just, you know, doing the Russia lie, but, but that's okay. Cause, cause we need Tucker to, to, to balance the scales against all those, you know, lefty media people, right? We just, we don't want them to control the narrative. So we need to have our propaganda out there too. Or on the other side, you, I, you know, I'm more on the left and Rusty's more on the right, but kind of my circles, it's, yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I, I know that, that Biden or whoever, you know, or whatsoever me, because it's, this is a puff piece about, about Zelensky or whoever, but, but we need it, right? We need it to, to counteract what you hear from Fox News or whoever. And this is how we become useful idiots when we, when we want our propaganda to be out there with some good excuse for it, balancing the scales, don't let them control the narrative. I get all that. It's all, it's all bad though. It, 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 it's what turns us into useful idiots ourselves. So that's what the note was about. And that's what I, I think about Tucker. I mean, he's got his shtick. Like I say, I think he's well compensated. More power to you, brother. Um, but he's a useful idiot. And it just, it just befuddles me that so many people will go on to Twitter and, you know, retweet Elon or Tucker and talk about how, oh, you got to have a free mind. You know, you really got to, you don't, you don't want to have your narrative prepackaged for you. And it's like, do you really just not have the, the, the self-awareness to realize that your narrative is prepackaged and force fed to you? I, I mean, really? I am leaping into this transition for us. Tweet of the week. We're not just talking about prepackaged. We're talking about shrinkflation. <laughs> Love it. it has been it has been prepackaged jack explain to us what you're about to flash upon the screen here well it's interesting because we, we've talked about that you know there's so many things going on in the world that are there are major issues you know we've just talked about what's going on in the middle east you know we're going to talk a little bit later about the border crisis you know we've got inflation we've got all these things and yet i, I think there's been two issues that nobody's had the courage to bring up um and, and you know one is obviously we've got a huge crisis and our president did have the courage to bring this up We've got a huge crisis in the airline seating area. Um, and in addition to that, when I was eating my bag of chips at the Super Bowl, it was smaller than it has been in the past. And, and uh, there's, there's a hidden inflation, obviously, inside of that bag of chips. So um, I, I, could read the, I could read the tweet very quick just to, uh, yeah, to get it there. Do. It was uh, from Joe Biden, and it was, while you were Super Bowl shopping, did you notice smaller than usual products where the price stays the same? Folks are calling it shrinkflation, and it means companies are giving you less for every dollar you spend. I'm calling on the big consumer brands to put a stop to it. So it's good. Joe has the pace of the country here uh, and he is looking at these two major issues and, and he is willing to go out there and address them. So what are your thoughts, Ben? Ooh. What are my thoughts? My thoughts are, I, did you guys see the last season of succession? Uh, I have not. Well, anyway, there, there's a scene where the, I guess he's the Murdoch figure, right? So the, you know, the old man is talking to his kids who are always scheming between and amongst themselves to take over the family empire. And he's talking to them and he says, I love you, but you are not serious people. <laughs> it's just, it's such a great line. You are not serious people. And that's what I think, Jack, I, 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 
I, I think that about our, both of our leading political candidates for, for, for president, you're just not serious people. And more perplexing to me is that, um, certainly my view is, is, is that, you know, that, that Trump's non-seriousness is just incredibly damaging for the Republic the, of the United States. I, I just, and so I get very frustrated at the non-seriousness of the Democratic side that they think this is even competent political um, campaigning because it's, it's not, it, it's, in fact, it's so incompetent that it, I, you know, not for the first time, I think, my God, is this intentional? What it, it, it's a quick example. So it's not just that while all this is happening, including the, the, the tweet about, Hey, airlines really need to let, you know, children change seats and sit for free next to, you know, a parent, which, you know, I'm all, anyway, that's, that's, I don't even want to get into it. I don't even want to get into it. So this is less than a week since three soldiers, U.S. soldiers were killed in Jordan. And I think it was the same day as we bombed uh, Iraq and Syria, same day. And the public media campaign is let's talk about those pesky airline fees. And it's like, I, I know that Biden, of course, Biden doesn't, doesn't do his own Twitter account. Of course he doesn't. But what the, the level of incompetence here is just, it's just, it's just mind boggling. What, what audience was that for? It, it's like, it's like a, it's, it's like a, it's like an 80 year old man's vision of what, you know, what you want to be doing on Twitter combined with some 32 year old, you know, political science PhD. And it, 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 it's just, it's just stupefying everything from, in this most recent one, you asked what I thought, Jax, I'm going to give it to you, right? This most recent one where they've got two cameras set up and it's, it's, it's like you need to see this, the, 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 the video here, because it, it changes viewpoint. It, it cuts like 17 times, 18 times. There are 18 cuts in this one minute video. It's just so bizarro. The language, folks call it shrinkflation. Sorry, this this word "folks" sets me off. So, so folks is an Obamaism, right? It was it was really popularized in politics, in political communication, to be folksy by Barack Obama, and he used it actually, I think, pretty effectively. It just I mean, my skin crawls every time I hear it, but. Anyway, folks was how uh, Barack Obama would would put in most speeches, and it was geared, like I say, I think pretty effectively at trying to build a rapport with the audience. So he's calling the audience who he's speaking to, either on camera or in per per in person, he's saying, "Hey, folks, we need to talk about X, Y, Z, right?" I'm a man of the people calling you know, I, Hey folks, Obama, Obama, like I say, could use it pretty effectively. Still really rankles Biden or rather the Biden's staff, the political staff, they can't even use it correctly, right? They're using it. Folks are saying folks are calling it shrinkflation. Folks, what, what, what are you talking about? It's, it's, Anyway, it's this, it's this faux folksiness that is not even being used competently, right? At least, at least Obama was competent 
in the use of narrative and these ridiculous phrases like, hey, folks, the, the Biden came in, they, they can't even do, they can't even be competent in folksiness. I'm getting worked up because we do have so much at stake, right? And it just, it, it just, it, it's just, um, unbelievable to me, meaning I can't believe it, that this is where we are in 2024, that we're dropping bombs all over the world and it's no more than a video game that, um, we're going to have an election between the two candidates. We're going to have an election between. And that I think by far the worst of those two candidates is going to win. Mm. I don't know, man. That's what I think. Is it like this tweeting stuff? Is it, are they just completely out of touch? Is there some strategist behind the scenes that is like thinking about, I want to appeal to this no. demographic group or something? I mean, com com completely why, why out of continue? touch. Completely out of touch. I, 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 it's, it's, I, I thought this when the, 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 um, there was some White House meeting, you know, where, uh, Pelosi and Stinney Hoyer and, you know, some other octogenarians were in there with White House and what they came up with was like some phrase, catchphrase. And it's really like the, there was an old commercial about where it was, it's the campaign where, um, um, I, I'll come back on what the ad campaign was for. I'm, I'm sure it was it was for Geico or something like that. But the the the, the elderly woman is talking to her friends and says, "I unfriend you." It was it was, it was like this. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. It's like this is not how politics works. This is this is this is what a seventy-five and eighty-five-year-old people. This is what they think are the effective catchphrases to speak to Americans today. Mixed with, like I say, this academic, weird, off to the side, never wouldn't know real world if it, you know, slaps you in the face and puts it. So, yeah, it's out of touch, Jeff. It's, that, it's out of touch in, in just in just the most pathetic way at the time where all Trump has to do is just shut up and he's going to win. But of course he can't do that, right? He has to insult the active service member, you know, Nikki Haley's husband, right? He has to say in his crazy weird ass world where, you know, the leaders of, of France and Germany are calling him sir, saying, oh, sir, what would you do if we don't make our full payment for NATO? Which is, you know, in the, in the list of conversations that never, ever happened, that's, that's got to be at the top of the list. Oh, sir, what will we do? And, and then he goes off on his, well, I'd tell Russia to go, you know, have their way with you. It's, what are, what are we, what is going on? Luckily, I saw Ka Kamala Harris, you know, announced to the Wall Street Journal today is that uh, she's ready to serve, which, oh man. Jack, I see you shaking your head, which means it's time for a dumb question. <laughs> That's my, that's my tell, I guess. Spare me. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so, yeah, this is another thing I don't understand. I mean, I guess what we talk about on this thing all the time is things that we don't understand, but the border, um, you know, we talked about this a little bit before we were talking about Bill Ackman and carried interest. And I had said, like, there's nothing that everybody agrees on more than carried interest. And you're like, no, there actually is um, the border. Um, and, you know, it just it just boggles my mind that we're, we're sitting here. You know, everybody understands and i think anybody on any side of the aisle 
doesn't think we should just have a wide open border that people are just coming through. I mean, we could have very different views on immigration and who we're letting in and how many people we're letting in, but I don't think anybody wants that. But yet that is what we have. And it doesn't seem like anybody is doing anything to fix it. And, and I don't know if that's like, it's not in anyone's political interest to do it or I'm missing something, but I'm just wondering why. And, and it seems like there was an attempt to make a bipartisan bill here in Congress, which is going to get killed. It's not going to go anywhere. So I'm just wondering, why is nobody attempting to address the border? Well, I understand why Trump doesn't want any addressing of the border, because it's, it's an insanely winning issue for him. It's an insanely winning issue for him. I mean, this is what I mean by he just needs to just shut up and stand off to the side, and he'll rule to victory. Because it's... it's In both reality and perception, it's not tenable the way it is, the border. I don't understand on the flip side, on the administration side, uh, because I think that there are some very easy unilateral steps they could take to change the perception of what's happening on the border. I honestly don't know how to change the reality of it. Uh, I really don't. I think that um, what you're hearing from the Trump camp and guys like Stephen Miller about what they would do, you know, deputize National Guard and create internment camps and the it, that that's just like Nazi shit that is just like that's as insane as anything. But and this is a but, it's not an and, but that whole campaign, and I'll use Greg Abbott as as an example of this, is so far on the the popular side of the issue. And my side of the issue, right? I think of myself as middle, and actually, I think I lean a little left, although it's been less so over the years. But it's like, no, no, no. I mean, you you, you want to put some, you know, you want to put some wire up, or, you know, on the the, the riverbank. You know, I'm I'm kind of there. I think what. Um, I think what the administration did was that they said, we can't let Abbott win. And so we're going to fight him on all of the policies, whether they are real policies or whether they are narrative policies. We're going to fight him on all of this because that's the knee jerk reaction. And so they've gone down that path. And because down, they've gone down that path, they can't. They can't change course to say, well, yes, we're going to take executive action to do some of the things that the executive of the state of Texas did. I don't think Abbott was thinking that far ahead. What I think was he said, I have a dominant strategy. I'm going to take these executive actions. If the administration does not push back, then I'll be able to say, look at the strong executive action I took. If the administration does push back, then their menu of choice for taking strong executive action is whittled down to essentially nothing. I think that's what happened, that the quote-unquote strong executive actions that the White House could take in this would be portrayed, I think, pretty accurately portrayed as, oh, you're just, now you're agreeing with what Abbott was doing. And they can't bring themselves to do that. So the fallback is, let's pretend like we can't do anything and that it requires congressional action 
for us to take strong measures because we know that those measures will fail and we can blame the Republicans for that. I think that's the position they found themselves in. I get it. The danger with that, though, is that you've now said our hands are tied. And the presentation of the president of the United States as weak, hands tied, can't do anything. Oh, but I'm going to talk sternly to companies about shrinkflation and about, you know, airline seating policies. You know, that, that you become Jimmy Carter. You become Jimmy Carter. So I, th I think that's what happened, Jack. Um, and they would like to look tough and look forceful, but it doesn't fit with the guy they've got. And they've already taken positions to oppose forceful action. So their menu of forceful action is really, really diminished. What's, what's crazy to me is in that, that whole thing you just went through, th there's nothing in there about like anyone sitting down and saying, L what is the actual right thing to do at the border? It's all political. No. It's, it's all basically, we can't make Biden look good before the election, or we can't make Greg Abbott look good, or like nobody cares at all about what is like sitting down and saying, what is the actual right thing we should do at the border? Which, as you said, is probably a complicated thing that's not that easy to figure out. But still, like you think people would put their heads together and say, let's give this a shot. And they're not going to do it. No, they're not going to do it. And so we're going to get whatever we get in November and then whatever border policies we get after that. We'll get something, you know, there'll be a big program announced after the election. And honestly, this as much as anything is why I don't want Trump to win. Because, I, I mean, if even half of the stuff he's talking about doing, it's just so, um, um, well, it's, it's, yeah, it, it, it's anti-American, right? It's, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know what to say, man. It's just awful. So, uh. On, on a more positive note, um, yeah. one of the things I've learned in, in reading Epsilon Theory over the years is whenever you take an article and you put it outside of the paywall, it's always like an awesome, awesome article. And you did that this week with Matt's article. Um, I sure did. Rebirth in, in Precious Metals, Crypto in the Sixth Grade. And so, and, and it was, I read the whole thing. It was, it was an excellent article. And I know Matt's Cultish Corner this week uh, references it. So um, Matt, what do you got? Well, let's talk about this. So if you haven't yet, go to EpsilonTheory.com. Somewhere along the top, there's a great picture of a mixtape that's out of my box of mixtapes that I opened in the basement looking for something. And then when I saw that, it was like, nope, this is this is the picture uh, right here. It's outside of the paywall. Go read, share it freely with your friends. This is just a sampling of many of the conversations that we have inside of the community in the forums and just, well, this is what I want to talk about. The comments on the post, the comments online. A lot of people, I got three takeaways, but a lot of people apparently had a pair of yellow pants. I heard about pairs of shoes. I heard about hats. I have to ask both of you, uh, Jack or Ben, did either of you have the thing that you thought was fine and then the world told you, oh no, this is not okay? Oh, I did. Jack, I'll let well, you go first. Did you have oh, something? I, I, I got it. I got it. Here it is. Over the, uh, over the year. I, don't, I don't think I had yellow pants, but... Uh, I certainly had a bunch of other colored pants. Uh, so, so mine, Matt, it was a, uh, it was a coat. It was, I, I don't even know what the coat was made out of. I think it was, I think it was llama fur. Nice. And I, I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. I had got it at a flea market down in New Orleans. And, you know, I just, I just loved that coat and it's, 
you know, the, the cold weather in Alabama is from, you know, after Thanksgiving, you know, it's like, it's only a few months, but I remember, oh, I'm going to wear this coat to school. I think this was eighth grade, right? So still middle school. And I just thought, man, this looks great. I look great in it. And, uh, that was, that was not the reaction. That was not the reaction. I, it was a yellow pants moment. For sure. It was a yellow pants moment. I am, I am so moved from the comments. And please, if you have any, you know, put them in the comments on this YouTube video or send them in if you don't want to share them publicly. I am so moved at how much somewhere in that age range, people seem to have a real harsh run in with this. Yep. Society puts a label on you. And in talking about the Bitcoin ETF and talking about precious metals and gold bugs, I relate it to some professional stories in the article too. We've all been dealing with this our whole lives. We just seem like we forget about this thing. So the, the second point I want to make on this was because it was another thing. And of course, especially in the Twitter comments, because where else would you get into conversations like this? And you start to get into like the maximalists and all these subgroups of like the crypto audience that I will not discount. I will also say I do not understand all of them. But I know this from music and from other things. The more narrow your identity gets into, I have seven different qualifiers of explanation for what I am. Then the more your identity has been overtaken by one thing. A huge theory or a huge piece on Epsilon theory and just like a, a running theme and a huge piece in when we're talking about narratives and we're talking about markets is if ever you find yourself being completely pigeonholed down into like just one thing and it's a thing, it's not for the better of humanity, you need to call time out. <laughs> you need to reclaim some of the territory around this narrow definition because, I, I mean, I think the techn technical term is you've become a miserly prick. <laughs> like, it just, it just sucks if your identity gets that trapped and some people show those colors in the comments on Twitter, but, uh, I, I want to just remind them this is a yellow pants moment too. come to the other side. We forgive you. And that's again, not to say anything bad about the maximalists or anything else. Like you can think whatever you want and be into the weirdest, most obscure little corner of the world. But if you let that define you, that's not a good path. Yeah, but Matt, you got your first taste a little bit of the Bitcoin maximalists. I know Ben has had his taste of them many times <laughs> over the, uh, over the years with the various things he's written on Twitter, but they're a fun bunch. They're a fun bunch. <laughs> They're a fun bunch. Um, and now, okay. So the last thing, and this came out, I was, uh, it'll probably be out when, when this, then this is live on YouTube. Can, here. can I just do say one oh, thing? Oh yeah, please, 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 please. The Bitcoin maximalists are pikers compared to the, uh, Buffett, uh, Warren Buffett value fanboys, which is another, it's, it's another trap. It's another identity trap. The intrinsic values of the Buffett fanboys are, are a whole other breed. <laughs> yeah. So we're not, we're not just picking on the, the, the Bitcoin oh, hell maxis, no. I swear. I swear. Hell no. <laughs> right. Jack, you know a thing or two about the Buffett loyalists. I do. Yeah. No, I've probably been, been in that camp a couple of times in my, in my career. <laughs> you know, uh, it was, all uh, these things. It was interesting. Like the, uh, I don't know if you guys saw the David Einhorn interview this week that he did a master's in business. But uh, a lot of those types of people came out of the woodwork a little bit about that um, because there were, there were some challenges like to, to fundamental investing and how he's changed his approach over time. And there was definitely some uh, not open to, to his ideas that was going on, on on Twitter this week. Nothing like inspiring conflict amongst our friends. Which is another episode we have to do with Ben sometime because it's, it's a very interesting topic to discuss. I am, I am very much into that, especially now as I grapple with, um, well, the joy though, and Ben, you can relate to this for a second. The joy of this sometimes is, I don't want to say, it's not like flaming these people with stuff, but like being able to respond to something. Cause there's a point where you just have to be clever enough to let yourself laugh. And so it's like, okay, I'll just start quoting Green Day songs from after the sellout period. And then like a handful of music people are then attaching themselves to that and finding great amusement with it. But have fun, right? That's, there's something wrong with having fun. 100%. You gotta, you gotta, it, it. It's so important, Matt, because we don't, there's so 
few opportunities to change your identity, right? And they're usually around going to school, right? Which, you know, moving from high, from elementary school to middle school to high school to college, sorry, you know, but, and people do reinvent themselves, which is always a, can be a little uh, weird when you see it, right? What I think you're talking about doing is always allowing yourself to grow and adapt in your identity and not to get boxed in. It's so easy to get boxed into this. It's so easy. It's so easy to find stuff to get religious about. It's so easy. This lands on the last point. I, I've got a piece that'll come out on uh, February 14th. I decided it's a Valentine's Day piece after working on it. Um, and I decided that because it came back to, to one of my favorite books ever. I've read it a bunch of times. It's called Still Life with Woodpecker. And in this book, uh, which the book is about a question on how to make love stay. You know, I'm thinking about it being recently married and everything else. But inside of this book, one of the answers to how to make love stay is, he says, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. When he says it's never too late to ha have a happy childhood, Robbins is not telling us just to think about when we're in sixth grade. And this is your point right here, Ben. And I feel this so deeply. He's telling us that life is a series of opportunities to grow, to change, to evolve, to try new identities on and to shed old ones that don't serve us anymore. But the trick is saying it's never too late to have a happy childhood is to be able to say we have to look back and love ourselves for those those things we tried on. So we wanted to try something for a while. That, that's okay. You got to learn to love that past part of yourself because that's the growth that got you into today. And you got to expect you're going to keep going through that into your future. Love that. Can't wait to see the note, Matt. <laughs> Valentine's Day, 2024. How to make love stack. Somewhere, at least on Cultish Creative. I'll share it other places too. Cool. Um, guys, I got a summary for us. So, we started off with in narrative world and my dearest Watsons, the dogs that are not barking are at least as important as the barking at dogs. And if there's no coverage of war, the big story here is the, the media doesn't care because if it doesn't serve anyone to care about it, that's pay attention to the barking dogs as much as the non barking dogs. You got to remember to look for them. We talked about Tucker. Wolf Blitzer, whoever your journalist is of choice, if you just blindly agree with our or their or your propaganda, then it's, it's just as bad. You have to be critical. You can't be used as an idiot. That's the definition of a useful idiot is you are allowing yourself to be used as an idiot. Think for yourself. We talked about shrinkflation. We talked about uh, the language of this stuff about Biden's staff using folks and why does that feel off? And the note I wrote for myself here is this, it's this incompetent contextual unawareness. I'm thinking of this, like I, you brought up succession. I speak succession to my dog. I know my dog doesn't aware this, but <laughs> he's unaware that like, I call my dog, my number one boy all the time. He does something stupid. I'm like, you're my number one boy. And he looks at me. I tell him all the time, actually, I'm like, he'll be barking at, you know, a leaf on the sidewalk while we're walking. And I'm like, you're not, you're not a serious dog. You're not a serious <laughs> dog. And, and this is what it feels like. It feels like the folks thing where it's just like folks plays right in the right context and the right hit TV show place. But otherwise it's kind of just a meme and, and looking for that is so, so important. We talked about the border situation where the only serious answer to any serious question requires, and Jack, I think this is what you're hitting on. It requires compromise and collaboration. That's in short supply in U.S. politics, and the border situation is probably an extremely clear representation of that. And last but not least, Ben, I have to break some news for you here. The frog in boiling water, did you know that was a myth? <laughs> I'm not surprised. Okay, that, but I love it. I love it. Frogs will get out of the water once it gets too yeah. hot. So, you know, as a, as a, an animal that, um, you know, needs to self-regulate its body temperature, 
Yeah. Evolution says they're actually pretty good at recognizing that recognizing when the water is too damn hot. Yeah, evolution is a problem for frogs uh, in this this myth here. So, what's interesting though is it's like I still think you're right about the sentiment of what you're saying because if you stay in boiling water, you will get burned, and that's what breaking news. This is what this YouTube channel is about. This is why like, subscribe, share with your friends because we're trying to talk about this temperature. We're trying to feel the water in, lit- in which we literally swim here. And just like we were talking about with, with the war stuff and the coverage, what's most critical here is we can't let humanity be invisible. We have to make this visible. I think that's why doing this with you guys is so, so important. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, guys. This is Thank wonderful, you. as always. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to like and subscribe wherever you're watching breaking news so more people can find our show. If you know another clear-eyed and full-hearted individual, why not share this episode with them too? Like we said at the top, the media is making us tick, and it's our job to talk. Follow the headlines at fiatnews.com. Follow Ben at epsilontheory.com and at Epsilon Theory on Twitter. Follow Jack at validiacapital.com and at Practical Quant on Twitter. Follow Matt at sunpointinvestments.com, cultishcreative.com, and at cultishcreative on Twitter.